the things you discuss, you do today, the output is very fast. And that's why like everything was very quick and we had to learn fast. I found a really great teacher in Ukraine that always pushes me beyond my limits. Uh, every session with him is kind of a test of my own abilities. So it's really, really challenging. I ha learn controlling myself through this. Well, this week was a story that just needed to be told. Medina Kata is the co-founder of Bulletproof Ukraine, a non-profit organization on a mission to save lives by manufacturing bulletproof vests to people who need them most in the region. Now, Medina did more than the usual donations and solidarity. She left her full-time job as a venture builder in Berlin to start this venture. So I wanted to find out why and how she has done this and how she has executed this plan with her team and what impact she has made to people who need her help the most. It's a bit different this week to the guest I would usually have, but it was a story that needed to be shared and awareness that needed to be raised. And I got so much inspiration from speaking with her myself. So without further ado, I'm Alex Bloisey, and this is the Building Our World podcast. So Medina, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I wanted to start by, obviously, in February this year, everything changed, and uh, it was a huge event in the world. Um, but what are your ties to Ukraine, and sort of what led you to getting involved in the effort? Yeah, uh, thanks, Alex, for asking that and for inviting me. Um, yeah, first, a little introduction. I'm Medina Kater. I'm a co-founder of Bulletproof Ukraine. It's a non-profit uh, Bulletproof vest manufacturer in Ukraine. Um, so my first um, touch with, uh, with Ukraine uh, was in 2015 mm. when I went there for um, New Year's and spent like 10 days, uh, which was really amazing. And I remember back in the days, I was so uh, impressed by the hospitality of the local people, by the food and the culture, but it wasn't love from the first side. Um, then from 2015 to, to 2021, I also had some two or three little uh, city trips and I always felt very welcomed and nice there. But again, I never had a feeling that oh, I want to be here every month. <laughs> and then in 2021, uh, in February, I came there for 10 days. Um, and all of a sudden, I realized that I love it so much. Um, and I love the people. I somehow immediately um, built my circle of friends within this 10 days, uh, where I've also felt very comfortable and welcomed. Uh, and after that, I decided to prolong my trip um, from 10 days to two months. Uh, and I never regretted it, although it was winter, it was snowing and cold. Um, but I just felt so good by being in the city. And I think uh, something in myself changed. Um, I kind of came to the point of my life when I knew exactly what I need from the world, so to say. And Kiev also grew as a city. Yeah. Um, it had like uh, an economic reasons for that. Um, I really do believe that um, the boom of entrepreneurship um, was the kind of reflection of um, the war that started in 2014 um, that made many people move from the west of Ukraine to Kiev, um, and it really um, motivated um, the competition and uh, motivated people to start working in different new areas in order to be, uh, yeah, like more competitive on the market and um, maybe discover the areas that are not covered yet. Um, and this made Kiev very diverse very hospitable uh, and a very comfortable city for living. Um, I just love the fact that in many places things are so digitized that 
Mm, you, for example, don't need to have any physical documents because it's just online in the app. Um, they all have their passports um, just yeah. in the app. And when you come from Germany, uh, where everything is very analog, it is, it feels very fresh and new. And I just loved being there. Um, so in the Sun 21, I kind of fell in love with Kiev and I spent every month there. <laughs> like I even told my employer that um, no matter what project I'm staffed on, I want to be in Kiev 10 days a month. And I got very lucky that my uh my boss was happy with that. And I was really living in both cities, um, half my time in Berlin, half uh, in Kiev. And I just loved this dynamics mm -hmm. um, and exploring the local culture more and more. And of course, um, I was, I grew very attached to Ukraine um, closer to the 24th of February. And I was worried a lot uh, and mm -hmm. worried is probably not even that um, doesn't describe my condition that much. I really thought that I will be cut off um, oxygen uh, if the war starts. Yeah, because it was it was a weird time. I mean, we can talk through the events of the twenty fourth of Feb, but for, from my side, obviously, like when it happens, like I I remember saying to my friends, "Oh, he's, it's definitely going to happen," but then when it did happen, I was still shocked. It was really weird. It was like you couldn't quite believe it, it was actually happening. You thought it was all sort of posturing. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously that day, I remember, I mean, I remember it well. I think it was a Thursday. Um, but what it was, was it a like? Thursday. Yeah. What was it like for you? What happened? Um, I remember I took my phone in the morning. Um, I read the news, and at the moment, I didn't realize how life-changing this moment was for me uh basically starting from this morning my life had changed completely um i of, of course i was very shocked uh, as everyone um, and i had a lot of anger and grief in me but i just decided to put it away and not think and live through those emotions for now because i could feel that people need help and my friends need help. Um, so I just immediately went to the volunteering work mode. And in the beginning um, of the war, I was just either on my computer or on my phone. Um, basically the whole day, um, my screen time was up to eight hours per day because I was just constantly chatting with someone organizing logistics, helping uh, with accommodation. Um, and it was just constant work. And I remember that my eyes hurt so much, but I really felt uh, that I cannot be not online because someone mm. might need my help. Um, and on the second week, I already started feeling that there are a, there are a lot of people who are starting to help also amongst my friends uh, in Berlin. And, and then I realized that maybe I can find some area um, where volunteers are needed, but it's not yet very developed. Um, and that's how um, I came across the idea um, of helping with Bulletproof Fest. At first, um, I try to source them and help um, the groups of volunteers that are buying them from the abroad. Um, but then I, that was the moment when I realized that bulletproof vests are first very expensive. Mm -hmm. Second, they are hard to source. And um, it's also not easy to bring them logistically to uh, Ukraine because it's not just um, a piece of clothing. Um, it, it is seen in some countries as a... Um, military object um, yeah. so it was all problematic and um, mm. I thought it's, like it's yeah. to cut time we need probably need to just try to produce it in Ukraine yeah because at that time what, certain countries were pledging lethal aid some were just purely humanitarian aid I suppose a bulletproof vest kind of blurs the lines of humanitarian and, and lethal aid 
Yeah, it's really gray zone, and there is a mm-hmm. lot of discussion about that also in Germany. Um, and I personally uh, sometimes also saw people who thought um, that by producing bulletproof vest, we are supporting the war, which is obviously not our motivation. Our motivation is save lives. Yep. Um, and uh, we are doing it for the people who want to leave. Uh, we don't produce it for people who are uh, they are like to to be to kill others um especially um now that we are focusing on the civilians um so on the second um week um i had this idea and um i thought of a friend of mine who could be a good partner to start uh this project um and it was very smooth. Um, we hopped on the call and it was a very quick call, maybe like 30 minutes because he had the same idea. Um, and uh, we agreed that we will find a production site, uh, try to do an MVP and then see mm-hmm. whether we can actually execute it. Was the production um, site, were you trying to find that in Ukraine at the time? Yeah, exactly. It how, was on in earth are you trying, how on earth do you do that in, in a in a war zone how how did that go you know it's pretty easy ukrainians are very entrepreneurial um people in general um so yeah we just agree that we need to find um maybe a metal workshop that can repurpose the facilities um for the production of bulletproof vests and then you just go desktop Mm -hmm. research uh and try to find like companies that have civil similar profile and yeah then it's just cold calling asking and yeah. you know it, in this state people were way more open than mm-hmm. they're in kind of like normal peaceful lifetime uh when you tell them hey we are uh here with this idea of um supporting the country they're of course very welcoming and also want to help because uh, for them, it's also uh, a way to support uh, the victory. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, it might be important for, for people listening um, and something I sort of learned in, in this research as well, like a bulletproof vest isn't just like a sheet of metal in in like a vest. It's, no. there is so much to it. There's testing that needs to be done um it needs to withstand bullets but also be light enough to to carry around um so it's what you've done is is an incredibly complex project in a, in a very short amount of time it's, it's very impressive um but you're not a you know like a, a metals expert you're not a bulletproof no, expert. no so no, no. how did you acquire this knowledge um and obviously you you had your mvp and you're iterating it all the time um so i mean how did your growth of knowledge in this area happen in such a short space of time um yeah to be frank um in the very beginning i felt like I was so silly in terms of bulletproof vests because I remember that I even asked some expert um, that we n- probably need one plate. It was in the moment when we um, were trying to buy bulletproof vest. Um, so asking, we need only one ballistic plate, right? And, and he was like, what? No, of course you need two, one in the front and one in the back. And then at this point I thought, wow, Martina, you know nothing about this. <laughs> um, but then of course we didn't do it ourselves. Uh, we didn't do MVP just with our own um, desktop research on how you produce Bulletproof Vest. We um, quite quickly um, organized a little team of experts and this um, were mostly people who worked in this industry, um, specifically in one company um, in Ukraine that exists already for years. Um, and we just um, collected um, ballistic armor experts and people who work with steel. Um, and we basically did it with them. It was their guidance. Uh, and they were showing us how to do it. Um, 
we were of course like together um adjusting the um metrics of the ballistic plate or the design of the plate carrier uh but in the very beginning they were leading us yeah. because we didn't know anything yeah. but on the uh, our side um there was of course like uh research and knowledge collection um just through internet and by talking to other experts so i basically uh, applied the same um venture development um framework as you do uh, normally you yeah. first like uh, learn as much as you can about the topic and then you set up um expert interviews to discuss the questions that you have left mm. and that's exactly what we did and as i said in the beginning of the war things were moving so fast it it seems like it was the most perfect work environment because the moment you discuss things um you realize that it will be done today it's not like a matter yeah. of two or a week time we the things you discuss you do today the output is uh very fast and that's why like everything was very quick and we had to learn fast we were yeah. motivated to do it but it's developed so quickly in, in the iterations um since i've known you as well as has been tenfold um how i mean how thick does a vest need to be to withstand a bullet because you're not just dealing with like handgun bullets it's obviously military grade weapons that you're defending yourselves against so um like exactly the behind it um so it really depends on uh the type of steel um each steel solution is, is different and um uh, that's why in the very beginning we were testing a lot of different steel types um there are market leaders uh for ballistic steel um but of course um they are quite dominant and um their steel is expensive um that's why we were exploring other solutions and actually our first uh steel samples came from azovstal um that was before uh it got um occupied um and now we are sourcing our steel from another plant uh in ukraine in dnipro um so usually uh we use 8 mm um steel type and our uh, bulletproof vest is for the fifth protection class it's qualified for that and we re also received their certification mm. um but uh with other steel type uh you can also uh use 6 or 7 mm we also want to try uh 7 mm with ours uh for the sake of making the plate lighter it's a uh, kind of our next step uh with the next production to see whether mm. we can make it a bit lighter uh, and maybe we will have to go down in the protection class but actually uh for the types of military actions that we are working with uh level 4 is already enough mm. so not not uh, steel is not all made equal no uh it also um depends on whether it's uh tempered or not whether you are yourself tempering it uh or it already comes tem tempered mm. we are doing the whole cycle ourselves so we are tempering the steel uh in house um uh, which is trickier because um yeah there are solutions when you just buy a tempered and you know that this steel type already qualifies for a certain yeah. protection class but as i said it's usually twice more expensive and since we are here to produce um very affordable mm. and as much as we can but at the same time not compromising on the uh quality um we do the whole cycle ourselves um and for that we have more we, we can acquire more mm. so how many people right now in ukraine are wearing your vests so by now we produced uh more than 500 bulletproof vests um and we are projecting to produce 500 more for uh civilians in ukraine mm. yeah because and by, you... by civilians i mean uh paramedics volunteers um 
journalists and people who are being evacuated uh, from the um, hot areas. Yeah, because you've, you've made a, a point to focus on civilian people with, with your vest. What's the thinking behind that? Um, so I think I should start here from our meta and mm. uh, we focus on saving lives. Um, and in general, we try to um, go along um, the concept of long-termism when um, the we, we try to do the most good with the resources and time that we have. Um, and since we are the only non-profit bulletproof vest manufacturer in Ukraine, we thought that we are also the one that should deal with the problems there are in the market. And right now, the biggest problem is that there are um, a lot of scam bulletproof vest manufacturers that don't have um, protection class certificates. Um, and they also sell their uh, products super cheap. Um, yeah. The Their price is basically the same price as our production costs but do it, they do it commercially so i'm i don't even want to think what kind of products the uh, materials they're using for production um and uh, the problem is that due to the lack of knowledge um people buy bulletproof vests that are really uh, a threat to their health and life um, and there were already cases of people dying from bad bulletproof vests. Um, therefore, we thought um, of how we can tackle this problem. And of course, we don't want to compete with such scam bulletproof vest manufacturers. And uh, the only way to uh, basically stand out uh, is to just give bulletproof vests for free to mm -hmm. civilians um, because um, civilians uh, are it is this uh, part of the population that um, cannot really test bulletproof vests themselves because they don't possess yeah. um, the tools for that. Mm. Um, and that's why we decided to shift our focus um, on only producing for free uh, and only giving it to civilians because they are like least protected uh, from all the people who need bulletproof vests. Mm. How are you getting it to these people? especially in a country that's that's being occupied? So right now, uh, Post is working really well. In okay. the beginning, uh, we had to um, deliver it ourselves uh, or people would come to our production site. But right now, um, yeah, it's pretty easy to send it via Post and they have a really, really well-working Post service. It's, mm. yeah, quite impressive. I think it comes within day. Yeah, I think it's probably good to point out because in the sort of the Western news, obviously it's just about the war and the the battlefields and the battlegrounds. And you can sometimes forget that there is a full country that is operating pretty well from, from what I've heard. Obviously, I don't want to speak for these people, but it's... There, there are. It's obviously a lot of uncertainty, but there's there's plenty of cities that are still able to operate on some level. A hundred percent. I was in Ukraine for two times um, since the beginning of the war, um, and I was impressed how Kiev feels like a normal city. If you uh, forget about the hedgehogs on the road and some scars of military actions in the city. Yeah. Uh, cafes are open, people are um, continue working, taxi is very uh, easy to order, same cheap as before, like maybe the prices for food uh, got a bit higher, but that's pretty much it. Mm. Um, and the biggest change you feel is not in the physical world, it's in the minds of people and like the things you talk about with your friends like the conversation just changed and they will probably never be the same um as before the war um uh, right now half of my friends are volunteers uh, some of them um also run um ngos or npos uh, as bulletproof ukraine um and the other 
let's say like 30% of my friends are serving. And this is the change uh, that you feel uh, when you, with your volunteer friends, talk about like whom they help. Um, usually it's the same narrative, like some family whose house got destroyed and they're left with nothing. Yeah. And with uh, my friends who are serving, it it's just um it's very weird to talk to someone when uh you realize it might be the last time you spoke you, you were speaking with them and um it leaves you with a very different feeling to yeah. your relationship yeah so that's where you feel the change the most mm. Mm. it brings you brings you back to reality have you had much help from i know there's a big ukrainian community in berlin do you operate in terms of your team is there, is there much in in berlin that you from berlin that you do um Vicha, um a volunteer team um that supports ukraine and berlin uh is helping us but um i would say there's not much of help we can get from other NGOs or uh, volunteer yeah. uh, organizations um, because Ukraine needs money and mm. every um, uh, organization needs money to operate. Um, so it's unfortunately um, only like commercial companies or individuals who can uh, donate or help uh in some way that um that are more uh helpful in this case uh, mm. and by like uh, saying that helping in some other way is that um there are um ways when let's say like companies can help not just with their money but by um i don't know offering their product to ukraine yeah. or something of this kind yeah, um, I think there's been a lot of, I, I suppose how it is, it's like the intensity of help at the start of something is lots and then it gradually sort of dissipates sadly as, as time goes on and people, people forget. But I, I wanted to um, just talk about you, to be honest, in these last few months. I mean, you've done a lot, you've achieved a lot, you've made an impact in Ukraine, but it must be an enormous emotional cost and from a mental health perspective as well. I mean, how on earth have you have you kept yourself together, kept yourself on task, uh, and working? Um, that's a really great question because um, I think I started thinking about uh, my well being um, only in June when someone asked me. So, how do you actually felt uh, when the war? started the full-scale invasion started and i realized that i uh had all of these emotions um just kept in some dark part of my mind um mm -hmm. and i kind of kept it until better times because i thought i don't have time to uh, live through them or be weak um or cry um, so I was always like postponing it uh, and I just learned living with it. I learned to keep, keep it to myself. Um, and, but then I thought, okay, I need to find a way to let them go in a very efficient way and not just like cry on the sofa for a week. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what really, really helped me um, is gong meditations. Um, and I came across that like really randomly when a friend of mine brought me to a, a sound healing class mm -hmm. and it was my first uh, experience and I was really shocked by how strong such meditation is. Um, I kind of like through, through the meditation, I let my negative emotions go and it all happened really naturally. I mm. didn't really plan it. Um, then, the, of course, sports uh, was a, a big um, supporter in this case. And 
specifically um, yoga, but um, not like um, the, I don't know, like yoga maybe in the normal sense. Um, I found a really great teacher in Ukraine that always pushes me below my limits. Uh, every session with him is kind of um, a, a test of my own abilities. So it's really, really challenging. Uh, and uh, I ha- learn controlling myself through this, uh, controlling, lear- living through pain, but mm. still keeping until the end. And it also projects into my um, normal life, let's say. Yeah. Um, then just also normal meditation um, yeah. every day. Uh, maybe it sounds trivial uh but it works and um journaling i learned that um sometimes it's better to just write things on paper instead of discussing it with someone um to me it worked way 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 better than uh, talking to my friends about um some worries that i had just writing it on a piece of paper and maybe throwing it away after it doesn't matter. But the fact of writing mm. was important. Yeah. I, I've, I've never really got into meditation. Maybe I should. Um, people have always said how good it is, but uh, journaling I've sort of done, I've done like brain dumps where if you're kind of overwhelmed with worries in your head, you just write every single thing that you're worrying about. And it's quite good just seeing it there. And then you cross out, everything that's sort of out of your control and try and forget about it. It's interesting. I was saying on the podcast uh, on another episode that um, I did that a few months ago and I was throwing, I was going through some notes and found this sheet of paper and I was looking at the list of things I worried about. I was worrying about at the time and literally I don't even remember half of the stuff I was worrying about. So it just shows how that in the long term, the majority of things you're worrying about don't actually matter. Exactly. It's just your brain is really focused on that in Mm. the moment. And that's also very natural uh, to us as humans. Uh, But when you zoom out, you realize that actually it's not that important and you will probably forget about it. It's the same as like um, sometimes you can forget about what you were fighting with some uh, with some person. Although in the moment it felt like the center of your world. <laughs> Absolutely. But with the job you, d- you do now, do you find much time to reflect and zoom out? <sighs> it's very difficult. And because um, this project uh, is so dear to me that I think about it all the time. It's the first thing I think about in the morning it kind of like it it is my alarm because i wake up i think about it and i'm so happy the the new day come came that i can continue working on my project and mm-hmm. I, and i uh, just want to get out of bed and start working um and that very often also uh leaves me in the state when i'm i feel that i think about it too much and i need to find a way to have some free space and i just try to time frame it because i really have to force myself not to think about it um and i try to give uh, sometimes on sunday that um i i'm just with my friends or like in nature yeah um but it's in general not very easy but not i i wouldn't say because uh it is such a difficult project it's because yeah. i'm so interested in doing it and i really mm. love it and i love our team uh we grew to um seven people now and every single one of the team members is super needed uh i love the n- dynamics we have half of our team is in berlin half is uh in kiev and yeah i just really l- love doing it mm. but why is that because i know there's plenty of people that have been you know gravely affected by the war um that lived in lived in other places and yet of course they've donated they've helped but i feel with, with yourself 
you've gone sort of one step further. You've started this initiative. Um, you, uh, it's basically f- it's full time for you. You're the face of the brands. Um, you've driven it forward. You're doing like the media side of things. Uh, what, why have you taken that sort of huge step to do that? And where's that's come from? Because, I mean, for me, and I'm guessing he won't admit this, but uh, that's very impressive, and it's it's a big point of difference compared to other people. So. Where has that drive come from to execute this? Um, I think uh, we as human species um, always think about the future of our um, of our world. Um, it's it feels like very natural to think of others and about the. Uh, prosperity of uh, humankind Um, and in this way um, if you want to help um, you can't just oversee this elephant in the room which is the war in Ukraine Um, and since I of course grew personal attachment to the country uh, and to Kiev um, I really wanted to help uh, initially uh, but then it also uh, brought me a lot of sense um, that what I'm doing actually has some impact to uh, someone else and not not just like a little bit uh, make their day <laughs> happier, but it can actually help their uh, them saving their lives. Um, and if you if I compare it to any other um, commercial work I was doing, regardless of how good the product was. Um, I used to work as a venture developer and we were making a lot of interesting projects and I love it too. Uh, but in this case, it's really more than just like trying to find uh, how to make the customer's life a little bit better. It is about helping a customer to leave uh, and uh, if you look at it from this perspective it, it is just an endless motivator uh, when things are going a bit rough and um, we are some slow with the production we always keep in mind that there is someone who actually needs a bulletproof vest uh, because they are in the they are going to Donbass for example to evacuate some people there and you think, well, you are now sitting in your comfortable flat in Berlin uh, and there is literally nothing that um, threatens your life at the moment. Well, you have no reason to not work and not do things faster in order to help the, those people who are actually in danger. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a, the biggest motivation um, uh, I think, like trying to help someone who really devotes their lives to um, saving others or um, who were affected uh, by by the war and has to flee. Mm. I love that. I, I love that you're, you're genuinely helping because you genuinely want to and you're doing hard things to help people i think sometimes a lot there's a lot of virtue signaling and people sort of say they're donating because they, they want to feel good about themselves but i mean what you're doing is is super super hard but right now i mean what does a typical day even look like for you um so i start my day uh from um planning um for the team um because yeah, our team is a bit scattered and um, also it's, with the time zone, um, it's a bit different. Uh, so I usually um, go through Asana and we um, plan like the outputs for today. Um, then oh, we usually have some calls with the organizations that need um, support, um, civil organizations. Um, then since we are now in the fundraising phase, uh, we are aiming to collect 120 
thousand euros to uh, produce 500 bulletproof vests for um, civilian organizations in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I speak to potential uh, investors. Uh, of course, there will be more um, donors. Um, and usually these are either individuals or uh, commercial companies. Um, so I talk to them and in the afternoon uh, I work on the back end of our website because uh, I'm still doing the U- UI um, and UX of our website myself. Yeah. Uh, but we have a full stack engineer who is um, doing the technical part. Um, and uh, we are launching two new features on our website um, soon. Um, and I'm really busy with working on that. The first one is um, we want to add more transparency to our work. Uh, so we are uh, offering a program where you can donate directly for the production of Bulletproof Fest for certain civilian or uh, civilian organization. So on okay. our website, you can just see who needs Bulletproof Fest check their website, maybe even talk to them. And if you wish also uh, financially support the production of vests for specifically them. And uh, the second one um, is basically um, made for our supporters uh, where we want to reward uh, people for donating to us yeah. because now we are at the stage when we don't want to just take, we want to give back and uh, we are coming up with different um, ways to uh, gift people who are helping with maybe NFTs or merch mm. or m- maybe some um, uh, collaboration presence with some brands. Um, uh, I don't know, like a, uh, skincare kit uh, and stuff like that and unfortunately this is how you have to do it now because um, since the war in ukraine is not making headlines anymore uh yep. you need to be more creative and uh, appealing to people uh to support because like just the morale uh is not enough Mm. already yeah i I think there's like a theory that when a crisis happens you have eight weeks to get people on side and get people donating uh from outside that is and then after the eight weeks things start to dissipate people almost because it is i mean even my turn on the news now the war in ukraine and it's like getting almost like a normal thing and it's yeah. you, you you mean rightly or wrongly i mean we're all human you get desensitized especially when you're not in the actual situation um because it's it's something that's given to you every day and it just becomes less shocking it exactly. shouldn't be you get yeah. used to it um uh, and you also get very tolerant to awful pictures uh yeah. from the front line um but it's human nature and uh, there is no one to blame. Uh, you just have to learn working with it, kind yeah. of. And that's um, our next step as a, yeah. as a company um, to turn from just a bulletproof as producer to someone uh, or like something that's actually also very interesting to participate in. Uh, uh, because it has some value uh, for you personally and and not just for your um, feeling of being a good human being because yeah. uh, you support it. Um, it. It is challenging because it adds like another work stream, which is really different from what you were initially were doing and uh, what's kind of like your core which uh, in our case is bulletproof fast production but now we have to work on our nft collection um that also has to be interesting and it has to be um with come with good pr because then it re- grows in values um it, it is exciting from one point uh, from one hand because um 
it is also something new to me and I learn a lot uh, through that. But at the same time, it of course distracts you from the main thing, but yeah. one cannot be done without another. Mm. Yeah, because you, you're you getting to the point now where you, you have your solution, your bulletproof vests, but you almost now have to make people aware of the problem as that was being done for you at the start with the sort of shock and awareness of the war. But now you got to keep reminding people that there's there's people suffering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You named it. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, uh, and it's been amazing to hear your story of, of the last few months and, and what you've been doing uh, and why you've been doing it. But like, I mean, how are you doing right now in yourself and with the workload, the emotional workload as well. I mean, how is your well-being these days? Um, sometimes I feel like I went very far and there is no one to advise me on where I should go next. Um, it's a very uh, odd feeling because um it seems like only people who walk the same uh road uh, can understand you and that's usually the case uh my fellow um volunteers co-founders of other ngos they experience the same uh, when you started the project it's it is going really well uh but you feel that the setup changed and it became 2x more difficult yeah. uh, to run it and you think oh should I continue or maybe I should stop and do something on my own um, because of course like there is a, a psychological feeling that you've already done a little bit so maybe y- you can now go on uh, but I decided that it, it is a journey for me and I have um, a certain uh, goal, which is in my case, uh, make Bulletproof Ukraine a self-running company where yeah. uh, we have like a very stable um, system of how we finance ourselves. Um, everyone in the team starts receiving salaries um, it, because I really want to uh, provide workplaces for Ukrainians um, now in it's not only the war, but the economic uh, part of life in Ukraine is very difficult. Um, And we, in the future, uh, do more than just Bulletproof Fest. Like, ideally, we also uh, collect money for the reconstruction of schools or uh, kindergartens or some um, objects of the important local architecture. So I have this vision of um, this company being like a social impact maker and also using the brand um, that we already have for this cause. But Mm. at the same time, uh, I feel that it will be very difficult to get there. um, And I don't really know how fast we can get there and uh, what is like a work frame. Uh, work frame for that Uh, but I decided that uh, I will just follow the process and this is the phrase that I keep in my head uh, all the time to just like blindly go uh, Mm. and not think of ifs because um, your your brain naturally sends you signals hey what are you doing maybe you should stop Um, but I decided to just go and see where it brings me yeah, sometimes overthinking is can be the detriment of a founder. But I mean, I mean, one of the things about being a founder, and many founders say this to me on this podcast, is that you're on this path, you're on this journey, you're maybe the first one breaking down certain barriers or testing out certain problems. And it's hard because no one can relate to what you're doing. Um, and they can support you. But if they can't relate to you, that's quite a lonely place to be. And I imagine for you, I mean, there aren't many people walking the same path as you right now. Yeah, that's exactly what I feel. I, uh, it feels like I cannot really um, talk with 
anyone about it um, yeah. and receive a very clear answer uh, yeah. because I have to find it for myself. And of course, it's also very individual, um, but it also makes it very exciting. And I'm, I must shouldn't lie that um, I also learn a lot through this and I meet such interesting people from really different backgrounds. If you look at my Telegram chat, you can see everyone from, I don't know, some uh, politicians to people with, um, with guns, like people who serve on the front line, to other volunteers and m maybe some artists or um, people who run interesting companies who support Ukraine. Um, and I meet these people through this project. So um, it's not only difficulties, uh, it, it is a lot of joy and, and unexpected turns um, that all, also make it like super beautiful and interesting journey for me personally. And it lets me grow a lot. Mm. That's why um, it's not just the set difficult part uh, it comes with a lot of treats absolutely well it's been a worthwhile cause and a worthwhile conversation as well um we, we'll wrap up things there but thank you so much medina for for coming on it's been a conversation and, and you're a guest that's sort of a bit different to the norm of this podcast um as it's obviously centered around tech but i really wanted to get you on to to hear your story to hear why you're doing it and what it's been like um, and also a chance for you to get your message out there to maybe a different audience as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, an inspiring story. But thank you for, for what you've been doing uh, and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Alex. And maybe I will uh, just add quickly that we do uh, things in tech as well. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. starting from tomorrow, uh, I'm going to participate in a, a Tech, uh, Kiev Tech Summit uh, okay. and I will take part in the hackathon myself uh, with Bulletproof Ukraine team. We are um, uh, developing a solution for uh, donors uh, or like for NGOs uh, in general uh, which is centered uh, around pretty easy thing uh, which is a unified database for um, donors from crypto and through normal payment channels. Um, it, it sounds very simple, but there is no off-the-shelf solution for that. And many uh, NGOs in Ukraine are not familiar with crypto. Uh, yeah. And if they, if they are not familiar, they don't know how to um, convert crypto um, uh, in Ukraine properly um, to get like normal uh, hryvnat, let's say. Um, and that's why we want to come up with a solution, uh, which is a one stop for, uh, NGO, uh, yeah. to raise money to crypto and normal, uh, payments, but also like have the donor management inside, um, collect the information, um, send emails and etc. Uh, so let's see. Uh, whether where it will bring us in any case we will have a working solution even if we uh won't win anything and of course we're not there for winning but uh as i said it is very exciting project and we have like m many multiple uh many smaller sub projects in it like this one for example mm. Absolutely. Um, well, we'll link everything in the uh, description. So where, wherever you're listening to this podcast, uh, check out the links below for the website to donate. I think you can donate in Bitcoin and Ethereum from what I could see, as well as obviously conventional ways. So um, yes. please do do check that out. Uh, an amazing cause, an amazing story. So thank you so much, Medina. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much for listening to the Building Our World podcast. Every view, stream and download is massively appreciated. If you're new here, then please go back through the catalogue. There's some great gems from some of the brightest and the best in Berlin tech. And if you really like what you hear, then please do hit that follow and subscribe button. That's it for now. But until next time, goodbye.